Hello and welcome to the Franz Van Kattel interview. I'm Annette Young. It's not easy being a whistleblower, least of all an Israeli soldier who decides to go public about his or her time serving in the Palestinian territories. Breaking the Silence is an Israeli organisation that offers soldiers the opportunity to voice their testimonies. Their aim is to expose the harsh realities of the occupation to their fellow Israeli citizens. So far, it's collected somewhere in the order of 700 testimonies that's formed the basis of a book entitled in English, Our Harsh Logic. It's just been published in French and with me today from the organisation is its co-founder, Yehuda Shaul. Yehuda, thanks for being with us. Thank you very much for having me here. Now, you were a uh, former soldier serving in Hebron in the West Bank, one of the flashpoints in that part of the world. What made you decide to break the code and speak out about what you witnessed? It was towards the end of my service when I was a company sergeant, the last three, four months. And just sitting down with myself, starting to plan my life after military service, for the first time as an adult, thinking like a civilian rather than a military personnel. Um, that was a change for me, being able to start to see things from a different perspective. And in one minute, my world has collapsed. For two years and 10 months, I was in the military doing things, believing that I'm doing the right thing, living in a reality which has its own logic and its own ideas inside. But suddenly from outside, it seemed wrong. And that's when I felt that I need to do something. And I started talking with my comrades. And breaking the science was the result of that. Was there one single incident that did change your mind about taking that risk and speaking out? It's not one single incident, no. It's two years that I served in the West Bank, that I, what I experienced and things that I've done. From bursting into houses in the middle of the night and seeing the families and how they react, till manning checkpoints, arrest operations and other things that I've done. It's a whole package. And when you reached that point, were you revolt? by what you had witnessed? I mean, once you started to explore all those past incidences, did you start rethinking the whole package? Yeah, definitely, yes. I think mainly for me was learning things about myself way before about the big politics. Um, I went through my service believing that I'm a good guy and that we are the good side. And suddenly I discovered what we've done and what I took part in. And that's why I felt that I need to do something. And how would you describe what you took part in? I was trained as a combat soldier in the Israeli Defense Force to defend the, to defend the country. You know, God forbid Syria, Egypt starts a war against Israel. We're here to defend our borders. But what I did at the end of the day was enforcing our military rule over all people, over all the Palestinian people, making sure they are stripped from dignity and freedom, that they don't live as equals to us. And that's basically what I was doing. Now, of course, the Israeli Defence Force and the political establishment in Israel would argue that you were indeed defending the security of Israel. At the end of the day, a lot of the things I've done, I don't understand how, what they have to do with the, Israel, with the security of Israel. When I served for 14 months in Hebron, the largest Palestinian city in the West Bank, my mission was very clear. My mission was to defend and protect the Israeli settlers who live in the city of Hebron, which is very different than defending Israel. When I served on the Lebanese border up in the north, my mission was very clear, to protect and defend the northern border of Israel. So even if you follow just the mission statement on the briefing walls inside the military barracks that I served in, you see that there is difference between protecting settlers in the heart of Hebron and protecting the state of Israel. But there is more to that, and that is that in the reality of military occupation, yeah, what I found myself doing is crossing every day that goes by, crossing moral lines that I never thought that I would cross before. And slowly, slowly sinking in this reality where every Palestinian in front of me was not any more human being like me, was an enemy, a potential terrorist, or wasn't there at all. I was based in Jerusalem for seven years and what you've done by setting up this organisation and going public goes very much against the grain of Israeli society. Just how tough is it? I really don't see it as a tough thing. I think as, as someone who was there, as someone who served in the occupied territories and did what I've done, after understanding what I've done, I don't think I had a choice. I had to stand up, I had to break the silence. Yeah, because this is the most crucial thing that our society is facing. 
But the, 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 there are many people in Israel who would accuse you and have accused you of being a traitor. Yeah, they will. Um, and you, so you're telling me that's not tough? No, I, 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 think, I think they're entitled for their opinion, and I think it's okay. And, and I understand that what we're dealing with, which is, yeah, talking about the military and what it's doing there, is something that touches very, very deep into the heart of Israeli society. So it makes sense that people get very angry and very aggravated by what we do. But this is a fight over the soul of our country. This is a fight over what will be the moral values that will define who we are as a people and what we stand for. And in breaking the silence, we are over 950 combat soldiers who say, occupation, no. Yeah, that is wrong. This is not the path to go. Is it possible for an Israeli soldier to serve in the territories with a clear conscience? I don't believe that a soldier who served in the occupied territories has clean hands. It's but not that I think that we are all, you know, it's not that we, every soldier murders innocent Palestinians. Far away from that. But no Israeli soldier who served in the occupied territories, his hands were clean after that. Because at the heart of what you do, there is no way of seeing Palestinians as equal human beings to you. I'll just give you one example, which is, you know, nothing extreme, nothing exceptional, something very routine and banal. I served for 14 months in Hebron. Right now in Hebron, as we are sitting here and having this discussion, there are two military patrols that their job is to do what we call in the military to make our presence felt. What does it mean? The military logic says this. If Palestinians will get the feeling that the IDF is all the time everywhere, they'll be afraid to attack. So what do you do to give them this feeling? You make your presence felt. You start your night shift patrol. 10 o'clock till 6 o'clock in the morning, eight-hour shift. You walk in the streets of the old city of Hebron, break into a house, Palestinian house, of course, not a house we have intelligence about. I'm the sergeant. I lead the patrol. I choose a random house. Wake up the family, men one side, women the other side, Search the place. You can yourself imagine the dynamics, yeah? Climb to the roof, jump from one roof to another, come out through another house, wake the family. And basically, that's how you pass your eight-hour shift. 24 hours a day, seven days a week, from September 2000 when the second Intifada started. Till today, now. It didn't stop for one second. Yeah, the idea is that every Palestinian will feel the military is right here. You don't know when we're going to show up, what we're going to do, when it's going to end, how it's going to look like. It's to do what we call in the military... To create the feeling of being persecuted. Now, when this is your mission, again, this is not an action of a rogue soldier or officer. This is your mission. There is no way of doing it nice. And what impact does it have on those Israeli soldiers who have to carry out that task? I think we are living in a reality where for over two-thirds of our existence as a country, yeah, 46 years... This is our national project. All our resources are put into controlling, ruling on other people. And that's our project of the nation. And in a way, this is how Israeli men are growing up in the country. And not only men, but women too, because you take testimonies from women combat soldiers as well. Recently, exactly, combat units, more and more combat units are open to women. And of course, that's a whole other aspect, which I cannot speak from my personal experience, but from the experience of my comrades, my female comrades, but definitely yes. This is how you grow up, in a reality where you are a combat soldier, where violence is not the answer for everything. It's the instinct that you answer with to everything, in ruling others, in being used to see the other not as equal to you. Does your voice represent the minority of soldiers or the majority? My political analysis, probably, and my political standing represents the minority of soldiers, probably, yes. But the facts that we are talking about, no one can dispute. So if people, if soldiers will be in a disagreement with us, it will be about the political conclusions we draw. But the facts of how we behave and what we're doing, that's not up to dispute. Yehuda, is your message being heard, though? I mean, is there any sort of glimmer of acknowledgement from people within the high-ranking levels of the Israeli Defence Forces or the Israeli political elite? So this is a very important thing that you're asking, and, and, and that is, I think it's important for me to state that we are not aiming at the military. I don't believe the IDF is the problem. The political mission the IDF gets is the problem. When we send our military to maintain a prolonged occupation, that's how it looks like. Because so the you're, only... you're needing to change Israeli public opinion? Israeli politics, Israeli policy. And yeah. the, the thing that drives Through that is, is public opinion. Yeah. But do you think your voice has been heard by all sectors of Israeli society? It certainly doesn't appear to be the case. No, sadly no. Sadly no. 
I think it's a uphill battle. It's not an easy thing. But this is where it's important to, to mention. Silence is not an Israeli disease. Silence is a human epidemic. When a society doesn't look good, the last thing it wants is to deal with these bad things. And in a way, our job as breaking the silence is to hold up a mirror in front of our society and force it to deal with it. There is a lot of optimism behind our work because we do believe there is a big chunk, a minority, but a strong minority in Jewish-Israeli public. A growing minority? I don't know if a growing, but a strong minority in Jewish-Israeli public that once confronted with the facts will choose our side because they share our values. And our crusade is for them to know and know and force them so they cannot escape. They cannot say, oh, these abuses are exceptional. No. Hundreds of soldiers are standing from all units, different ranks. This is what we've done. Because the problem is, of course, Israelis cannot go into the uh, Palestinian territories. They're banned unless you're a soldier or a foreign journalist or a diplomat. Um, and, I mean, part of the problem has been, as a result, whenever international media covers the story, it's seen very much by local Israelis as this is the way the world views us, but we know it to be different. So, I mean, do you think what you're telling them, that there actually is going to change that uh, default position? Sadly enough, the Israeli media is not doing its job. If the Israeli media would have told a story, there was no need for breaking the silence. And this is where we come in, to fit in the gap. Yeah, breaking the silence operates in a very simple logic. I'm now a civilian back in my society saying this, guys, you sent us there to do the job. We went there, we've done it, we're back home. We're not gonna tell you who to vote for, but there is one thing we demand. Sit down and listen to what we did in your name because we were sent there in the name of our society. And that's, I think, as people who were there and done it and, done it, and did what we've done, it is our moral obligation to stand up and break the silence. Are you doing this for yourself or for Israel? I'm doing it for myself and for Israel. I'm an Israeli. This is where I live. This is where I'm going to live. I'm not going to leave. That's my homeland. And this is a struggle over cleaning my home. Finally, Yehuda, do you think there will ever come a time when Israeli forces will permanently leave the West Bank? I have no doubt. And I really hope that I'll see the end of the occupation in my lifetime, because I think this is the only way Israelis and Palestinians will be able to live side by side in peace if the occupation ends completely. Yehuda Shaul, thank you so much for being with us. That's it for this edition of the Franz Bankat interview. Do stay tuned because there are more news and headlines coming up very shortly.